Good afternoon and welcome. Um, excuse, excuse my voice. Um, it's cold season in the heat, and I'm just getting over it, so I'm not contagious. I'd like to welcome you uh, today. It's really uh, a delight and an honor, and I'm very excited to have um, Christina Biaggi come and speak to us today. Um, and I'm really thrilled uh, that all of you are here. One of the great uh, parts about the forum in the center is that we are able to provide and produce programming like this. Um, and so I'm delighted that you're taking advantage of it, and I'm sure that you're going to have a wonderful uh, opportunity to hear and to have dialogue with Dr. Biaggi. Lucy Lepard wrote in the wonderful Power of Feminist Art by uh, Gerard and Broad. She wrote, feminist art replaces modernist egotistical monologue <laughs> with dialogues between art and society, between artist and audience, between women artists of the present and those of the past, Intensity arises from the rawness of personal experience and impact from the power of personal truth. Um, when I was thinking about this center and starting <coughs> this center and having this center, this was a very important piece of information for me to think about. The suppression and oppression of women in any form, whether or not it is mild or radical, is directly linked to a biological fact. This means that our bodies are targets, and this is very personal. Hence, feminist art and the mantra of feminist art is the personal, is political. The work manifested by uh, women and feminist artists and women arts activists is usually honest and intimate. It's sometimes raw and confrontational and demands and it often commands our attention. I read this before we begin today. Would you like to come in and have a seat or you just sort of want to see whether or not you want to stay? I'm not putting you on any, no, stay. Stay as long as you want. You can stand right there. The act of creating creates action, as the action of creation is acting in creativity. Working in art is an action, and is the action of creating action. Action and art, art is action. These days, creation and action, by word or by deed, by inference or exactitude, is on everybody's mind. I wrote that this morning. Thank you very much, and please join me in welcoming Christine Biagi. Oh, that was lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was just wonderful. I, mm, that set me up. I have been an activist for a long time, and my activism has inspired a particular body of work that I've created at different periods of my artistic career. Besides going to the usual protests against the proliferation of nuclear weapons and the nuclear industrial complex in New York City, Washington DC, and other places, I protested along with other women all over, from all over the world in places like Greenham Common, Comiso, and, and, um, and Seneca Falls in Upper State New York. All this activity basically took place in the 70s and uh, the late 70s and early 80s. And this has inspired the body of work, which I'm going to show you. In 1980, slide, uh, webs were woven in connection with the women's Pentagon action. Women were protesting the Pentagon's role in nuclear proliferation. Spider webs were woven uh, ar around the fences of the Pentagon, around the Pentagon itself, as a symbol of uni women's unity in a common purpose. The web was considered to be a powerful symbol of the worldwide women's movement, emphasizing women united in the protest against the nuclear industrial complex and the desire for world peace. What follows is the beginning of the unity statement of the women's Pentagon action, and you can 
forward and forward again. We are gathering at the Pentagon on November 17th because we fear for our lives. We fear for the life of, the, of this planet, our Earth, and the life of our children who are our human future. We have come here to mourn and rage and defy the Pentagon because it is the workplace of the imperial power with, which threatens us every day. Every day while we work, study, love, the colonels and generals who are planning our, our annihilation walk calmly in and out of the doors of its five sides. You can go on. We are in the hands of men whose power and wealth have separated them from the reality of daily life and from the imagination. And then it's from the Women's Pentagon Action, 1980, November 17th. I didn't go to the first Women's Pentagon Action, but I did go, there were about 10 of them in all, and I did go to some of them. And here are some images of, of some of the later ones. Slide. Uh, slide. And slide. Okay. <laughs> and slide. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about Seneca Falls. Slide. Um, these, some of these images are, many of these images are mine, but some of them are by Catherine Allport, my friend who was also up there at, the, at Seneca Falls Peace Encampment. Women created uh, encampments situated next to missile bases in order to protest the proliferation of, of weapons aimed at the Soviet bloc. In fact, peace camps were established all over the world, including in Nairobi, Kenya, and certainly you know, in England, in, in, in Italy, in France, in, in Germany, in uh, Holland, there were a, a lot of peace camps. In all cases, women wo wore, wove webs surrounding the army bases. I visited some of the encampments, as I said before, three of them. I stayed at Seneca Falls a few weekends in 1983, slide. And with hundreds of other women, took part in peaceful demonstrations, including climbing over the fence into the nuclear base. And then, of course, as soon as we climbed over, we were arrested, and that was part of the whole thing. Uh, as you can see here, uh, many of these women are nude because that's what they did. And uh, of course, this created problems with the surrounding uh, populace, which tended to be a little more, um, bu you know, Bible-believing and all that. Okay. Um, a few words about, okay, slide. A few words about the Seneca Falls Peace Encampment. It was founded in 1983, and it was modeled after Greenham Common. And uh, here is the main uh, house of Seneca, slide, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to read you the vision statement of, of the, the Seneca Falls, vision statement which is from the back cover of the encampment handbook. And this is what it said. Women have played an important role throughout our history in opposing violence and oppression. We have been the operators of the Underground Railroad, the spirit of the equal rights movement and the strength among tribes. Remember, this is at Seneca Falls, so uh, the Iroquois tribes were very, um, uh, it, they were based there. And giving voice to the 19th century feminist movement. Once again, women are gathering at Seneca, this time to challenge the nuclear threat at its doorstep. The Seneca Army Depot, a Native American homeland once nurtured and protected by the Iroquois, is now the storage site for the neutron bomb and most likely the Pershing II missile, and is the departure point for weapons to be deployed in Europe. Women from New York State, from the United States and Canada, basically from all over Europe and, and from Australia and New Zealand and so on and so forth, came to Seneca Falls in, you know, uh, in, the, in the early 80s. The existence of nuclear weapons is killing us. Their production contaminates our environment, destroys our natural resources, and slide, and our human dignity and creativity. But the most critical danger they, they represent is to life itself. Sickness, accidents, genetic damage, and death. These are the real products of the nuclear arms race. We say no to the threat of a global holocaust, no to the arms race, no to death. We say yes to a world where people, animals, and plants, and the earth itself are respected in values. And I don't think it's changed much since then, unfortunately. Um, so what did we do at Seneca Falls? How did we protest? Okay. The encampment utilized a number of different techniques in their protest to bring their causes and issues 
to the attention of the outside world. They use many ritual elements. They, the women would protest in large circles, holding hands, weaving webs of yarn around each other and around the fence or army depot. They performed slow walks where they would walk in slow motion, twisting, turning, pulling each other along. In one protest, they tied themselves to the fence with ribbons and yarns, and we'll see that slide. Um, masks, uh, in one, okay, other demonstration fe featured singing, dancing, masks, costume, makeup, and signs. Sometimes die-ins were performed. This is a die-in here. To imitate war casualties. There was even a laundry ritual in which women hung sides in a local laundromat while doing their laundry. <laughs> and, and of course, fence climbing was the chief activity, which usually resulted in, in, uh, in arrest. Okay, slide. 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 These are two women from Greenham Common that came to, um, to help us protest. Slide. This is my friend Gail. Slide. Slide, slide, slide. Okay, climbing the fence. Slide. It looks as if she's being booted across the fence. Slide, slide. Look how happy she is. She's being arrested. Slide. And here's a young woman from Minnesota who's who's. Uh, encountering the soldiers, slide, and being arrested, slide, slide. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to talk about one incident. It's called the Waterloo Bridge Incident. In, on July 30th, 1983, about 100 women from all over the U.S., including women who had been at, um, at Greenham and who had participated in some of the Pentagon actions, um, walked, began a peace walk from Seneca Falls all the way to the women's peace encampment. Four miles, four miles into their walk, their way was blocked by several protesters, local protesters. So what did they do? And these protesters started calling them and saying, commies, go home, lesbians, um, vegetarians, uh, all, all kinds of other things like that. No. <laughs> to diffuse everything. The women sat down in the classic position of, you know, nonviolence. The standoff lasted some time, and the police told the marchers that if they did not disperse, they would be arrested. So uh, the townspeople threatened the women with their flagpoles. I didn't actually see this, but I heard all about it. Let, threatened the women with their flagpoles as if they were um, swords. And here they were, you know, and, 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 and saying that our action would lead to conquest by the Russians and the denials of our freedom in the United States. I mean, you know, it was all very dramatic. Finally, 54 women were arrested, including the wife of the mayor of the town, because she had joined the protesters. And then eventually the charge was dismissed. Okay, slide. 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 These are women being arrested, wailing. Slide. Slide, don't they look happy? <laughs> the fence, slide, slide. This is one of the women, the 54 women, slide. Another one, slide, slide. One of the women sitting down, slide. Onlookers, slide. Witnesses, yes. Slide. This is uh, in the center there. This is Gwen Kirk from Greenham Common. She was quite something, if anybody remembers her. Slide. Slow walk and wailing. Slide. A die in. Slide. Another die in. Slide. At the main gate, Nagasaki Day. Slide. Slide, slide, slide. Some of the locals with their motorcycles, slide. Catherine Allport photographing them, slide. 
and some confrontation between the media, as you can see on the right slide. The locals. <laughs> slide. Wonderful picture. Slide taken by Catherine Allport. <laughs> Slide. 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 And this is a women's sign, of course, that we used to do all the time. Slide. Okay, and this is... Um, was in the local paper, and I'm here. That's me with a hat. <laughs> and that's Gail behind me, a friend of mine. This is after we climbed the fence with 600 people, including Dr. Spock, the baby doctor, and we were jailed for a day. Slide. And then, of course, we talked, we had, we had uh, conferences about, you know, what we had done and what we had seen and what, you know, we had witnessed and all that. And here's one of the uh, f uh, flyers for one of the... Uh, uh, talks that we did. Slide. Okay, then I went in 1983. I went to Greenham Common and took part in an action with 40,000 women from all over the world. We dismantled a good part of the fence around the base and confronted the police and the bobbies. Here's part of my description of the action, which was published in Women News, uh, January 6, 1983. On Sunday, December 11th, 1983, about 40,000 women converged upon Greenham Common. Excuse me. U.S. Air Force Base to protest peacefully the installation of cruise missiles, which had begun in November and to celebrate two successful years of women's peace encampments, existence despite, despite mounting opposition, you can slide, from the government and the media. Women came from all parts of, of England, Europe, Australia, and the United States, and also, you know, in Europe. Some read statements for the benefit of the numerous international press who were present. The women, along with some, some men and children, started arriving at 10 a.m., and by 1 p.m., there were over 200 buses parked at the main gate. The women started moving around the base. Slide. Okay, here is uh, singing it in front of the main gate. Slide. Inside the Peace and Freedom tent. Slide. This is the living conditions in Greenham. Slide. Slide. Quaint. Slide. 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 There were some wonderful banners all over. Slide. And this is at the main gate. Look at the uh, poster, posters on the left there. Slide. Okay. All right, the women started, and slide, one more. Okay. These are onlookers. The women started moving slowly around the base, chanting, singing, milling around the fence like a slowly moving but powerful river. Specially recruited policemen, weaponless bobbies, and thank God they were weaponless, lined the fence on the outside, one in, uh, in every 10 feet. British military police were stationed on the inside of the fence at regular intervals, and behind them, American MPs armed with billy clubs and attack dogs. All of a sudden, a number of women tried to climb the fence slide, but were prevented by the bobbies. Then, as if it had been carefully prearranged, the women closest to the fence fastened their fingers onto the chain link and started pulling on the fence in unison, chanting and yelling. This massive effort produced surprising results in a short period of time. Before the police could react sufficiently, the fence was nearly pulled down in several places. 40,000 women. Slide. S slide. 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 This gives you an idea of the amount of women. Police reinforcements appeared swiftly and started to push the women away, knocking some of them down. But the women, undaunted, came back time and time again to the fence with increasing vigor. Now the British and the American MPs on the other side of the fence flew into action, banging their billy covers on the fence, some deliberately aiming at the women's fingers. 
Some of the women who managed to climb over the fence were vigorously pushed back by the police who may have been instructed to make few arrests and avoid greater publicity. Except for a few nervous policemen who overreacted, the police were well behaved considering the sea of determined women facing and greatly outnumbering them. 56 women were arrested and there were some broken fingers and wrists. One policeman suffered a concussion from a falling fence post. Uh, while fence pulling was the most dramatic part of the action, only a small portion of the women were involved. The rest supported them with shouts, singing, and keening. Mirrors were flashed towards to the base to turn the base inside out, which is a shamanic uh, technique. With the coming of night, there were candle vigils, group rituals, and more slow chanting, while the women continued milling around the fence. Pull the slide. Even though the main part of the action took place between 1 and, and 5, some activity continued until 8 and 9. And this is from the December 11th action at Greenham Common that was published in, in Women News, January 6, 1983. Okay, slide. 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 Women lived along the fence around Greenham from 1981 to 2000. The United Air Force Base and the British closed the cruise missile base in 1992 after the collapse of the Soviet Union. During the 19-year period from 1981 to 2000, the women wore, wove continual webs along the fence surrounding the camp. Throughout the camp's existence, thousands of women took non-violent direct action at the base and in towns and uh, places all throughout Britain. Actions were taken in the spirit of celebrating and protecting all life and challenging the basis of nuclear violence. The spirit of Greenham uh, not only uh, spread across England like a web, but the United States and Europe as well, and other places. Slide. Slide. Three Americans and three, oh no, four Americans and three British climbing over the fence the next day. Slide. Slide. And Bobby's repairing the fence. Slide. Okay. Slide. Okay. All right. Um, Comiso. I have very few images of Comiso in Sicily because I was arrested and they were taken, everything that I had, all my, cam my cameras and so on were impounded. So this is, you know, I'm going to have to talk about it. Um, slide. Okay, this is the town of Comiso. It's a small little town in the middle of Sicily. In Italy, the ragnatela, slide, word for Italian, for word in Italian for web, was started as a woman's protest camp on the outskirts of Comiso, an American cruise missile base based in Sicily in 1982. A few words about the Comiso base. In 1982, the small town of Comiso in Sicily was chosen to house the largest arsenal of cruise atomic missiles in Europe. Comiso was an especially sensitive area since it would link parts of, of Eastern Europe and Western Russia, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Egypt, and all of North Africa. The townspeople of Comiso were very upset by this and uh, about the nuclear base, and they signed a petition against the base. The participation of, of, the, of the women's groups was unique because the women couldn't go out um, the way the men, or they didn't go out the way the men did. So the women um, couldn't circulate as freely as the men. So they went from door to door and talked to other women about this, their, about their, uh, you know, the fact that they were very unhappy about the base. Um, and they denounced the U.S. project and urged their peers to fight against it. In 1983, female activists in Sicily issued an invitation to women throughout the world to join them in Comiso in March on International Women's Day. The result was three days of dancing, parades, and an effort to encircle the base. And unfortunately, uh, 
Violence occurred, however, when groups decided to try to stop the trucks entering the base, and the police responded violently, arresting many women and dragging them by the hair. So this was in the news. I didn't, I didn't participate in that action. I came in 1984. The women in the Ranyatela realized that the missiles represented the top of the iceberg in a society that takes a very passive attitude toward rape and exploitation. One of their most dramatic actions was sparked by this realization, uh, which came as a result of the following incident. A young girl was raped by three masked men. And um, no particular blame was attached to the, to the men, while the, the woman was kept indoors by her grieving and ashamed family. So the Catania women took this incident as their rallying point. 500 of them marched into Comiso and headed for the square, which was usually full of men. Each woman wore a sign saying, Io sono una donna che è stata violentata. I am a woman that was raped at Comiso. I am this woman. I was raped. When the women arrived at the square, they found it full of about 5,000 men. At first they were frightened, but then their anger took over. And, and you know, they, they realized that they were, you know, that this young woman had been raped and nobody was doing anything about it. So as a result of this, they started chanting and uh, they pressed the men back, and the men cleared a passage for them until the women were all inside uh, uh, with the men. And then the women linked hands, and they started chanting and, you know, and keening and so on and so forth, and they pushed all the men back out until every man was out of the square, and the men didn't make one bit of sound. Well, I heard this and I had to go, of course. I visited, <laughs> I visited the Ranyatela in 1984 with the intention of spending a few days there and taking part in some actions. When I, found, I, when I arrived there, I found no one there. It turned out that the women had, had gotten sick and uh, all at the same time, probably because of poor sanitary conditions, and had gone to the hospital. So I conducted my own protest action by climbing onto the roof of the of, of the utility, which was used as the basis for this camp. Something that was forbidden. Within 10 minutes, two police cars descended upon me and arrested me. And I'd like to, you know, read you what I, what, and I ended up spending four very, very interesting days in a Sicilian jail. Something I'll never forget. It wasn't that bad, but I mean, you know, in retrospect it wasn't, but at the time. I arrived at Comiso at uh, 3.30 p.m. on Thursday, January 12th, and was directly <clears throat> and went directly to the Ragnatela, the women's encampment, which borders on the Maliocchio Air Base. This is from um, a, 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 a periodical called Bad News, from, you know, that you probably remember, you New Yorkers remember Bad News. It's a gay, uh, it's a gay publication, well, a gay publication in the 80s. Okay. No one was there. I was devastated because I'd been looking forward to staying here so much. I called and suddenly a man, Tino, appeared and offered me wine, of course. <laughs> According to him, the women had left one month before because they'd all gotten sick and because the predominantly English women wanted to pattern the Ragnatela after Greenham and the Italians resented this, of course. You know. I found this strange and asked him to tell me how I could locate some of these women. So he did. He gave me some names and he gave me some telephone numbers. And I called and I uh, contacted a person by the name of Kathy Manius and Adelphia Sessa and arranged to see them in the next couple of days. Then I spent the night in a pensione right near the base. The next morning I got up and um, was at the base at 8.30. I went to the air base with the intention of photographing the Ragnatela and the base. So I took several pictures of the base, and I even took pictures of a sign saying, Vietato fotografare, la base. <laughs> no, don't take pictures of the base. Um, then I saw two soldiers who said, no, non si fa, non si fa. And I, and I took pictures of them. So of course, you know, I was, I was dictating what next would happen. And sure enough, I was, I was on top of the roof of the Ragnatela, when suddenly two police cars, from two different sides, barge in, you know, and then five policemen from each car jump out. 
and say, lei, sopra lì, venga giù subito, come down immediately. You know, I said, me, ma cosa ho fatto, what did I do? And so, well, it went on a little bit like this. Um, okay, one of them told me that since he was not sure, I had, so I, basically I was taken into custody. One of them told me that since he was not sure I was taking photos of the base, I would have to follow him to the police station. There I was interrogated and my passport and camera were confiscated. Uh, no, we don't have slides in this part. Um, I admitted that I'd taken photos of the base and told the Marechalo my reason for coming here, my feelings about the base and about the missiles and about, you know, the American presence in, you know, in, in Sicily in this terribly uh, awful fashion. Three hours passed. Finally, I was informed that I was arrested and had to sign several documents in front of a judge. I was allowed one phone call and I called Kathy Manius, one of the women who who I was supposed to meet, and she told me she would get me a lawyer. Then my bags were searched, my, camp, my photo equipment was taken, and my car was impounded. I was put in a police wagon and accompanied to the Ragusa prison, which is a medieval prison with walls that are two meters thick, and a gate, a front gate, that is about this thick. And um, the vice marshal on the way started telling me, you know, he said, I admire you, senora, I, you know, um, I have some miniature, I have some miniature paintings in my house. Maybe you'd like to come and see them after you get out of prison. <laughs> and you know, and then when he, then when he left me in the prison and when he, you know, escorted me inside and so on, he started quoting Dante. He said, nel mezzo del cammin di vostra vita, mi ritrovai in una scura, you know. <laughs> okay. And then the, ga the gate clanked shut and that was it. I arrived at the prison at 3.30 p.m. and was fingerprinted and photographed. Then I, uh, I was admitted to the women's division and placed in a cell approximately nine feet by five feet. I stayed in prison four days from January 13th through the 16th. I was in solitary confinement for the duration of my stay, which meant that I was technically not allowed to have communication with the others and was locked in my cell the whole time except that I, when I needed to go to, go to the bathroom or when I had one hour to exercise. I had no communication with the outside world, no TV like the others or newspapers. The other prisoners were discouraged from talking to me. However, since this was Italy, we managed to talk and I was able to feel their human warmth and that of the four women guards who were also very kind to me. There were five other prisoners in the women's division, 190 prison prisoners in all. The men were, you know, naturally many more men. Two had killed their husbands, and I could really understand why they killed their husbands, because Sicily is a very patriarchal place. And three were in for theft. The food was abundant but very starchy. I spent my time reading. The hardest part was waiting for the event which would decide my fate. My lawyer and the judge were scheduled to arrive together to interrogate me. This would take place any time, day or evening. When I asked when, when I might expect this, I was told soon, in a few days, maybe a week. At 5.30 p.m. on January 16th, a guard came into the prison and proclaimed, La prigioniera Biaggi è liberata! And, she, and he banged. <laughs> I was elated and I kissed my fellow prisoners and the guards goodbye and packed my things. The guard returned, Is the liberated one ready? <laughs> So I was taken to the Justice Department where I was questioned for three hours, had to sign more papers and was issued an exit visa for January 25th. Then I was released and that was the, you know, that's my, that's my um, story. Uh, slide? Okay, well what, what did all this protesting accomplish? I think it made people, the media, aware of the U.S. involvement in massive amounts of armaments. Why did we climb the fence? How can getting arrested for doing so help the cause of world peace and nuclear disarmament? If the act is isolated and considered only as a literal event, it's worthless. It's, it's essentially worthless. Symbolically, climbing the fence is surmounting an obstacle, crossing a barrier, denying passive acceptance of the thing, of way things are. If the web is damaged or torn down, the spider recreates it again and again. In order to survive, the spider must never give up. Therefore, climbing the fence became a symbolic act of survival for women. 
By repeating this act of civil disobedience again and again, women tried to make the rest of the world understand that they were not going to sit down and give up. This was what we must start doing now all over the world. Some of us are already doing it in some way or other, um, in art and you know, in, in, in talking about it and so on. We must keep it up for our sake, for our children, for our animals and plants, and for our beautiful, work, uh, beautiful earth. Another result of this protesting civil disobedience, etc., was that some of us, like me, it were, create, were inspired to create art reflecting these actions or write about them. Okay, slide. Okay, the work that was inspired by these actions. Actually, so I did a series, um, I started in the 70s before I really, you know, took part in these actions. I started with a series of crucifixions, and here are some of them. Um, the triptych form, as you know, is used for these works with a way of depicting religious art in the Middle Ages, so that's why I use a triptych form, the three, you know. Th these are collages on wood, on a wood backing, and the, the, the triptych can, of course, close. These works reflect women's plight all over the world, her inequality, which in some instances is like a crucifixion, her second classness, her low position. Women on the wings of the crucifixions look on in concentrated empathy at, at the woman on the cross. Uh, and, and on the wings, you see, I was, in, you know, I was teaching art history at the time, so uh, a lot of these women are derived from Van Eyck, from Giotto, from Piero della Francesca, and others. And there's Joan of Arc here in the bottom. Slide. Here we, we have the, you know, uh, the female Christ on the cross and, and the, the sacred, you know, sheet that, that Christ was wound in, uh, touching all of the women. And here's Ingrid Bergman as Joan of Arc in that wonderful, yeah, maybe some of you will remember that. Slide. Sojourner Truth. Here. Slide. And black women have had, have had the worst time of all, I think. So. And here I started putting some of my friends and some of my, you know, some of my uh, relatives, like my sister, right there, and my mother up there, looking at the woman who is crucified. Slide. I also did an animal crucifixion because I was getting into animal rights, um, into protesting, you know, for animal rights at that point. And um, uh, the animal crucifixion is basically the same. It's even more horrible. It, it, it was very hard to do this piece, very, very hard indeed. And on the wings of this piece, again, like the crucifixion with the human beings on the cross, uh, the animals are looking on because they might be next. They might be next who might be tortured. Slide. This piece, the piece that I just showed you is two, two and a half by two and a half feet in size. And then I had it blown up to 14 feet by 12 feet and transferred the cloth and um, put on a frame and then I carried it in a big animal rights demonstration in Washington against the treatment of the Springfield monkeys by the Department of Health, if any of you remember that. Slide. Okay, and then um, in 1984, I started, um, you know, I'd already gone to a lot of um, encampments and so on. I started a piece called uh, Cutting the Red Tape, slide. And here I use the triptych um, motif, or yes. Um, this is, I consider this a precursor to some of my webs that you'll see later on. Okay, in this case, I show in the center panel and in, this, uh, in the, the wings of the crucifixion, I mean of the, of the triptych, I show um, the women's rights movement from the suffragettes, the women on the, on, the, on the left side of the triptych. I show um, uh, women against apartheid in South Africa uh, and on the right too. And then in the middle por portion of the triptych, 
you can see, you can probably see some of the images you saw before, Seneca Falls, Greenham Common, and so on. And finally, at the very top of the triptych is a woman, is my friend Gail actually doing the, the women's peace sign. And then there's a black woman, you know, uh, Eve, Lucy, or whoever. We are all descended from a black woman in Africa, as you know. S slide. These are details from the cutting the red tape. Slide. And of course, I couldn't get away from, from showing Giotto's angels. So here are Giotto's angels. Slide. And my daughter doing the peace sign. And my sister. <laughs> Slide. These are details, OK? And then, and then um, um, in the center, a lot of the uh, abortion rights protest in, in uh, in Germany and in Holland and also in Italy. Slide. And always the hands going up, pushing, pushing, helping, helping. You know, the symbol of the hands. Slide. The, su the suffragettes, Emmeline Pankhurst here. And her daughter, Sylvia Pankhurst, being, being carted away by the police in some of their demonstrations. Slide. and uh, confrontation at Greenham Common. Slide. Um, the Sojourner Truth. Slide. Coretta Scott King. Okay. Slide. Okay, and then I also, I couldn't resist I transferred this to, uh, to, to make it larger, um, and this is a recent picture of me in front of my piece. Slide. Okay, but my, you know, my great... Okay. Slide. Okay, finally I created a large piece, well, this was not that large, called, which I called the web. It was during this period of my life, naturally, that I was rediscovering the power of women and so on by visiting campus and taking parts in peaceful protests that I started to create webs. First, I created a small model, which you can see here. It's in, in my kitchen. And it was a um, um, collage, again. I used a double-sided collage this time uh, on pieces of wood, black and white collage connected with red string, the blood that connects us all. Our menstrual blood, our, the blood that goes through our bodies and so on. Slide. Okay, this gives you an idea of, you know, who's where on the web. And as you can see, there are three levels. There's the great goddess in the center, because here I'm, I'm, also, I'm also connecting it with women's spirituality, which I was getting very involved in at that time time, not only the political actions, but women's spirituality, which is very important to me. So in the center, we have the great goddess. And then in, this, um, in the first circle, there are three circles. And three is, is a sacred number. It goes way back prehistorically, so on. And um, each circle con consists of seven panels. Seven also is a sacred number. So I was getting into sacred numbers. OK, um, slide. Okay, here are the two sides of the web. And this is a very large piece that's 45 feet in diameter. And I had it transferred here in, on cloth. So it's a double-sided uh, piece and connected with red ropes. And this was in my backyard. I hung it on my backyard, you know. And you'll see an, uh, a, move, a short clip, a short clip about it. Slide. Okay, here are some of the panel details. You can probably recognize, you know, some of the green and common images that I took in this panel. Slide. This is one panel. This is a Seneca Falls panel. This is, you, can, you, can, you can probably recognize some of the images that you just saw from Seneca Falls. Slide. And this is uh, the web from the air, uh, a helicopter, and, and I photographed it from a helicopter. So that you get a feeling of the size of it. 
There's my mother sitting up there, way up there. Okay. Okay, slide. Okay, this is the clip. Their bigness was exciting to me because it, it's so bold and, and it was big enough to be tangible. Me putting together the pieces. No women were tilling the soil, sweat and strain from their toil. They were tilling and a hoeing while dancing and a flowing to the reaper and a soul. Many women and some men help me with this. This is my mother. And my aunt, both are gone now. There they are. Everybody got into the act. That's my sister. You can only see her hand. And find some happy time for play. No women were controlling the Am a feminist? That's my aunt's voice. And uh, I am interested in anything that advances the uh, positive ideas of feminism. She worked at the UN, so she's something any cause that, that you know, but women, so she was very clear uh, to everybody. Women struggling for rights, for peace for freedom throughout history for a couple of hundred years. All right. Slide. Okay. Then I became, um, I continued my web work. Um, I, I, next came the three-dimensional webs, which I started doing, just with rope and uh, with some spheres, which are you know, symbolize the macrocosm and the microcosm and so forth. Okay, and um, with the web is meant to be an extension of the idea of interconnection with all living things and our need for peace. The three-dimensional web was first installed at Thorpe Gallery in Spark Hill, New York during the fall of 1990. And here's an image of that. And um, 31 women participated in its five-day creation approximately one mile of different colored ropes and varied widths, lengths, and textures were woven using the wall and ceilings as anchors. The effect on the 127 feet by 34 feet by 14 foot space was both dramatic and inspiring. R ropes were hung from all angles and heights, encouraging the viewer to interact with the piece. So that's the three-dimensional, that's the first uh, three-dimensional web. Slide. And then next came, you know, I did a series after that. I did a series of eight in different parts of, uh, of the United States and also in Europe. This one is um, in Rockland Center for the Arts in West Nyack that I did in 1991. Next. This one is I did in Mount Holyoke in uh, 1992. And I used the trees, the outlining trees, whatever, you know, obstacles, trees were there. I, that's what I used. Next. This is in Parco di Villa Tiguglio in Rapallo in Italy. Next. And Lausanne in Switzerland. Next. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about my about some of my work around the theme of Medusa, which to me is connecting my political activism. With, with my women's spirituality concerns. Medusa is an aspect of the great goddess about which I'd like to briefly talk. Next. Okay, uh, this, was, this is the first Medusa that I created, and I created these, I, I've done a series of them. Um, 
This one is called the You Medusa. You all, I'm sure you all know the patriarchal myth of the Medusa, how she was decapitated by Perseus, looking into the shield of Athena, uh, who, had lent it, who had lent him the shield so that he wouldn't have to look into her eyes and die. That's the patriarchal myth. But there's a matriarchal overlay. And how do we know that? Because uh, of certain motifs that that Medusa has, such as the snake, her snake hair, which uh, bespeak her ancient lineage. Snakes are the terrestrial alter ego of the goddess. This, this, this goes back to the Paleolithic. The power of women's eyes. When Medusa was supposed to be able to turn men into stone. Okay. The power of women's eyes is considered dangerous in certain societies. Women create life and they can also take it away. The malocchio in, in, in uh, Italian, uh, southern Italian culture is a case in point in prevalent in many parts of the world as southern Italy or in Turkey. What is, what's, the, what's the significance of Medusa's power that can turn men into stones? This combines two symbols, the power of her eyes and the fact that she turns men into stones, into megalithic monuments, into stele, which are the, you know, which signify that she has, she has deep association with the death goddess. Okay, this Actually, my sister is responsible for this, for for for, for my creation of this um, piece, because we, she came over to walk dogs with me one day, and I had just uprooted this U, which turns out to be sacred to Hecate, and this U was lying in my drive, and she said, "Chris, this looks just like the Medusa." So you know, 108 hours later, I had this piece, which you know, next. And I failed to mention, it's my face 25 years ago whenever I created it, because I created that piece in 1978. Then, okay, I did a black Medusa, and here the Medusa is on a, on a uh, wooden base, and the power of women uh, glances are staring at the viewer, as is the Medusa. So they all become Medusas, the power of the glance. Next. That's also my face. Next. Okay, then I created a, um, another type of Medusa, a laughing, a red laughing Medusa. And this time I used the face of my daughter. And everybody in the piece is laughing. I had, at one point I had a, a bumper sticker in my car saying, she who laughs lasts. And I think laughter is a very, <laughs> is a very important political tool so here are some images of people laughing. We can go through them very fast. Uh, next. That's my mother laughing. Next. That's my aunt laughing. Next. My sister laughing. <laughs> next. Me laughing. <laughs> next. A person that I met on a de demonstration laughing. Next. My friend Catherine Altport laughing. Next. And my daughter. And, and here's my daughter. Uh, I used her face for the Laughing Medusa. Next. Okay. Next. Oh, and here's the, the one that I did in 1995, called the Raging Medusa. And uh, for, for her face, I used the, I used, as inspiration for her face, I used Maria Callas. Uh, hitting a high C in a performance of B uh, Bellini's Norma at the Met. <laughs> uh, next. Next, I'd like to talk about two works which I consider part of my political spiritual work, the Gigi sculpture in the Goddess Mound. Next. The Goddess Mound is part of my political work in that it's a metaphor for the single most missing value and patriarchal culture which we are in, connectedness. The emotional isolation necessary to commit violence is healed by the mound. The part becomes connected to the whole and we are all part of life and thus beloved by the mother, by the goddess, the ever renewing life force. And right now it is more important than ever before to consider how we're treating the earth, our mother. The climate crisis is more important than ever and you know, you can see the weather lately has been uh, hysterical. Okay, uh, so I created this as part, actually part of my 
uh, PhD dissertation. I created this piece called, which I call the Gigi Sculpture. And it's a, it was a fort, it's no longer in existence. It's made of paper mache, it was meant to be a model. And it was 24 feet by 14 feet wide by eight feet tall. And it was a paper mache structure um, with the, uh, a wire armature inside, and inside it was a negative form of a female figure, the goddess. And you entered through her navel, because we're all connected by our navels to our mothers. So um, it took me, it took me about two months of very, very steady work to create this piece with the help of, of several of you know my contingent, my mother, my sister, my my you know people, my friends, and all that. Uh, next. This is the inside, and, and it's difficult to see that the inside is, is, is actually the negative form of a female figure. That's, that's the, maybe we could turn the lights down a little bit because of. Okay. Next. Okay, here you can see kind of, sort of, that this is the arm, this, this negative female figure is lying down with her earth, with her uh, legs uh, going inside the earth below her knees so that she doesn't have you know long legs and she has her arm draped along her side and she's still in a sleeping position okay next okay now we're going to watch a small clip of the the Gigi sculpture taken with an antiquated 19 81 camera. The great goddess sculpture took two months to build with the help of 11 people. It is a paper mache structure using a wood and chicken wire armature. It measures approximately 23 feet in length and is 12 feet in width and about seven and a half feet high on the outside. This work was inspired by the findings of my research on the Maltese and Scottish megalithic structures, which are explained in my dissertation images of the great goddess. My intention in this sculpture was to literally depict the body of the goddess as a temple to be entered. The sculptural thrust of the piece is on internal space, the negative shape of a reclining female figure, six times life size, lying on her side, one arm draped along her hip, her legs disappearing into the earth below the knees. See, this is its final column. It's very difficult to see because this is not a you know terrific video. Okay, next. Next. Okay. The goddess mound. This is the one I'd like to build somewhere. Okay. This one, the sculptural thrust of this piece will be twofold: an outside earth mound and an, in, an inside negative space of a female figure, this time giving birth. The exterior earth mound will be approximately 20 feet, 25 feet high, quite big, and 74 feet in diameter, and will be covered with wild grass. The inside figure made of some permanent material will be approximately 20 feet, two feet high, and 14 feet wide. All of these measurements are, you know, uh, the design of this figure I did with the late architect Mimi Lobel, who used to teach at Pratt. The figure will be in a squatting, birth-giving position. The floor will be 3.5 feet underground and will be entered through a passageway leading from the outside doorway directly into the figure's vagina. And we all come from there, so, you know, there's no problem. At one point, there was a, a college in the south which almost accepted this piece. But as soon as the president actually saw <laughs> what was involved, he quickly called me up and said, no, I can't have this, I'll be crucified on the front lawn. <laughs> The inside will be painted an overall red ochre with swirling black designs and possible pictographs. Okay, slide. This is an aerial view and you can see the long passageway inside into the, uh, into the um, sacred precinct, which is the, the inside of a female figure. 
The shape of, a mound, of the mound is an oval recalling other megalithic monuments in the British Isles and elsewhere. The mound's entrance will be directed so that the winter, winter summer solstice will penetrate deep inside the mound, the way it does at New Grange. The mound's astronomical metaphors are two types, the ones that have to do with the moon and the ones that have to do with Venus. And all the dimensions have to do with uh, sacred numbers. I designed this work with the help of the later architect Nibi Lobel, as I said before. If you'd like further details on the Goddess Mound, please go to my website, goddessmound.com, and you'll, you'll see you know, other things. Both the Gigi and the Goddess Mound were inspired by Maltese and Scottish temples slide, and tombs from the Neolithic period, which I studied for my doctoral dissertation, which I got in, which I was awarded in 1981. I believe that the creation of such a structure is very important for now in this era of growing attention to women's place in history. I think such a sculpture will renew our thinking about architecture as habitable sculpture in harmony with the environment and about sculpture as a symbolic embodiment of the goddess's presence and character which forms an architectural hold with the landscape and is related to human need. Next. Other works. Next. Just to give you a smattering of things that I've done, you know, recently, more recently, which also are politic, you know, political in nature. In the in the mid '80s, I traveled to Nairobi, Kenya, to attend the Third World's Women's Confer International Conference. There, I was inspired to create this piece called "52 Percent," because that's what we are. We're 52 percent of the population of the world, and all of these images I uh, I photographed. The center one is a little girl that I met in one of the black spots because I also went to South Africa to witness the apartheid at that point. And one of the little girls that were in the black areas, black spots, where the, the, the blacks were confined during the time of apartheid. And she, she's, she represents Lucy or Eve, whom we all come from. Um, next. Then in 1995, I attended the fourth women's international conference in Beijing and created this sphere which I call the Beijing sphere. Again, I photographed all of the, uh, I took all the photography of these women and many of them were activists such as, this one was an activist from Fiji. She was protesting the French involvement in the nuclear stuff, you know, in the, in the test there. The one way up there, the Indian looking one, she was a lesbian from Sri Lanka. And she was so happy to be there because we had a wonderful lesbian um, uh, demonstration in Huaru, which the Chinese were, you know, uh, very worried about. And she was finally able to be completely herself and she was ecstatic. And um, this is an Italian activist and so on and so forth. You know, they're all, I, you know, I remember a lot of their stories. Next. And uh, lately, lately, uh, well, in the in in the last millen in the latest millennia, uh, I reacted, of course, to the to the 9/11, um, and this is my piece uh, about 9/11. Unfortunately, it's not very well photographed. It's a very large piece. It's it's 20 foot by a nine nine foot collage on cloth. And uh, it shows you the, you know, the whole events of 9/11. And uh, since my partner died at that, you know, shortly thereafter, I connect 9/11 sort of with her death. So here she is, disappearing into the sky. You know, that, an image of her. Next. And then I did this, "We the People," which was, um, again, it's a large piece, 16 feet by 6 feet, collage on cloth, which re reflects all the demonstrations and marches that took place all over the world, um, including Antarctica, to try to influence our misguided government not to start a war in Iraq. So the, the people come towards you, you know, visually. Next. And then, of course, the, the inevitable war, which we're still in. I won't even comment beyond that. Next. Then in 2004, I had, a, I had a show at Series Gallery, and um, I called it Disasters. <laughs> and the first one is the election of 2004. And as you see, Bush is depicted in the center. It was very difficult to work with, with his image. Uh, like the dark, dark lord in the Lord of the Rings with a fire conflagration all around him. 
while he gives his ridiculous grin and his thumbs up sign and wears his idiotic grin. All around him, like ticker tape or, or and expanding in size as they get closer to the edges are copies of email messages that I receive from all over the world uh, in Italian, French, and English, which are basically my languages, after the election saying I'm devastated, I couldn't get out of bed, and so on and so forth, you know, and, and longer messages in Italian and English and so on, um, as a result of, you know, this disastrous election, which we're still feeling the results of, of course. Next. Then I reacted to the tsunami of Southeast Asia, and um, uh, again I used you know the motif of hand. First of all, I was inspired by Ho uh, you that know art, art history, Hokusai's wave, which is very famous. Okay, and this piece is also quite large, uh, uh, 15 feet by six or something like that. And on one hand are the the women who have all lost their children, and you know the people in in the water, and on the other hand. Uh, these people were saved by, by this person right here. And then there's a famous tortoise and the hippopotamus, which some of you probably know the story of. The hippopotamus was a baby hippopotamus and, and bonded to this old ancient tortoise. And they're still apparently together. <laughs> the next. And then the latest, uh, the have-nots inspired by the events resulting from the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. On the left side, you can see the haves leaving because they have cars to leave, while the rest of the people, the have-nots, have to endure the frightening destruction of the hurricane in its, in its subsequent aftermath. Okay, then I've come to the end of this. As for my writing, inspired by my activism, I've written three books. Um, Habitations of the Great God is published in 1995, which examines temples, tombs, and dwellings inspired by the Great Goddess in Malta in Scotland. Then in the Footsteps of the Goddess in 2000, which is a compilation of personal stories by women and men uh, of their experiences with the female divine. And then the latest one is um, the Rule of Mars, 2006, my publisher is right in the back there, uh, which are essays by 32 experts in the field on patriarchy and, you know, the advent of patriarchy and the effects of patriarchy, you know, in this world. Um, I hope that, I've hoped that I've conveyed you the importance of creating art inspired by activism as a means of reflecting the activism, as a means of continuing the activism, because we all need to, to, to do that. And I've also shown you some of my work inspired by my activism. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your attention. Ah, are there any questions? This is one of the camp songs from Seneca Falls. Any questions? Yes. Um, well, it's just, just a comment, but I, 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 among the many things that had an enormous impact on me watching this, I was struck by the, uh, the web issue. You know, as a psychologist, we're taught that the, the spider web is usually, and it's taught as if it were a universal symbolism, and, and that's the only way to interpret people's dreams. It's the predatory mother engulfed by, by the mother has a very, very negative image. Mm -hmm. But you're using web as connectedness, as regeneration, as all kinds of good things. And it struck me that it's, it's so necessary to even question the kinds of things that we learn and sort of accept that they really may have some political significance. Well, That's yeah. only one aspect of the, of the meaning of it, you know, that, we, uh, that can be taught to us. Same thing. Thank you very much. We all have to always question. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> question authority. Another very good bumper sticker.
Any, anybody else? Yes, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nikki. In the crucifixion, yes. um, the female body is unblemished. I mean, it's not shown as, as, it, as in Christ, where you know you see the blood and you see the marks of. Uh, That's of a very good comment. And, um, and yet she's preserved. In her, you know, I mean, and you were depicting it and evoking the you know the suffering mm -hmm. uh, of the Christ. But I was wondering about that aspect. Of it. Well, she also had. She also. That was my partner before Pat. She she had. She had uh, cancer, and there is a. She she does have. If you look closely, she does have a wound, right where Christ was supposed to have his wound. Yeah. So. Any any other questions? Inspirational. I, I, I want to mention, usually I do a full introduction at the beginning, and I had a feeling that our, the opportunity to hear um, Christina was going to give us Christina. So, uh, but for our video, I'm just going to read uh, segments of, of your wonderful uh, in, um, uh, biography. Uh, Christina Viaggi has re achieved international recognition um, for her work and uh, contributions in the field of goddess-centered art and her scholarly studies. Uh, her work uh, is a reflection uh, and an extension of her lifelong interest in the classics, art and art history, archaeology, literature, languages, Vassar, Harvard, NYU. This is a very, very good lineup. Uh, when she isn't preparing for new pieces, uh, she's writing, lecturing, working with children's Shakespeare theater. She has mentioned her books to you. She's lectured and uh, exhibited throughout the United States and Europe, and she continues very evidently to fight for justice in all aspects of her life and in aspects, of course, of ours. Her, her book, we have three copies in the back. They're signed by Christina. They're available for sale. Um, the Rule of Mars, reaching about, uh, readings about the origin and impact of patriarchy, which I think is really relevant and very connected to today's, work, uh, today's lecture. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Liz, for doing Thank you. Thank you.